that we're going in for the real rubber hitting the road and having on to the conversations we've had around you know, listening to the Ugandan Investment Authority setting the stage for you, SMEs, on how you can tap into what they have to offer, then listening to what MTN has got to offer in terms of how to broaden your financial base and get yourselves richer by simply investing earlier in time. Now, how about we sit as a partner and discuss around the financial challenges you face and how you can break through. We've already had now one area of breakthrough. How about we get to listen to another? So as I introduce the following panel, will I then invite the following people to come forward? Tony Otoba, you're the Chief Executive of Standing Business Incubator. Vicky Namsoke Kayemba, you are the acting sector head, oil and gas corporate and investment banks at Standing Bank. Then I have our good friend, John Walgembe, the guy from the Foundation for the SMEs. And then I have an incredible member of the SMEs, as SME as they come, someone by the names of David Ogaga Senkari. Now mark the names you give your children. David Ogaga Senkari. Yes. From Mitiko International, you are into occupational health and safety. You are also a trainee from the Standing Business Incubator Cohort 6, and we thank you that you have agreed to be a part of this panel. So as I mentioned your name, I wish that you come forward and take your seat, and then I tell you some other interesting things that will follow up. So this panel is going to speak to us in exactly 20 minutes uh, because again we traded our time for shares, Indian shares, otherwise by now we'll be going in for our lunch, but then you'll agree that we made a worthy investment in, pro, in putting our lunch forward. That means that where we get one coupon, because of MTN shares that we are trading in, we will get an extra coupon. At least maybe for a hard drink, who knows, depending on the other side of the But that's it. So when you look at the panel before us, we've listened to everybody that has a rank. But I think it's important that now we set the context in conversation by one of us, and that's why I'm coming to you, David Bugaga. As an SMP, there are so many shackles that hold you back from flying, and one of the hardest of them is financing. In, uh, in 2004, me and my brother uh, <coughs> opened up a, a company. He was working in the UN. He told me, you know what? Let's form a company, stuff like the UN. He was working in Liberia as a procurement officer. So he told me, I know all the nitty gritties of procurement for the UN. So we worked hard. We won contracts actually in millions of dollars. We came around Canberra. We looked for funding because the UN does not pay finance. You supply and you voice. Now we went from banks uh, all down to individuals as a financial partners. <clears throat> My brother told me that in the uh, in Liberia, when you win a UN contract, you just go to the bank and they give you money based on that contract. So he said that I thought that would be the same in Uganda. We actually were customers of Standard Bank then. I think Tony was not there. <laughs> but we were uh, um, frustrated and uh, lost all those contracts because of lack of financing. We were told that you, you must have a collateral that is four times the first, uh, um, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, four times the, the first sale value. So now at that time you would need to own uh, like a building like Mabilizi or something like that. So we were just young people trying to 
So the country and the economy lost millions of money because of lack of trust. So from that experience, oh yeah, we've learned that uh, people have uh, the, the financing has got to trust the people who have won big contracts because the process of winning is also another vigorous exercise. So by the time somebody wins, um, there must be a, um, what can I call it, a benefit of doubt that this person's risk is lower. And I've had this something called Islamic banking where the bank goes all throughout the world with you from the beginning up to the end of the contract. Uh, that is something that I think should be done because we're getting into real business with the oil, there will be big monies, but our people don't have so much money. So uh, the banks, please, if you can take up that, you, you, you work with the contract holder, uh, you yeah, guide, uh, have trust together, well, yeah, everybody will benefit. But the issue of collateral and big stuff is, is the most Thanks. You listen to him, I'm sure many of you have faced the same thing, but David, I read recently in the press that someone to get shareholding some company that was going to get a contract in their company changed their name so that they are able to be in there. If I were you, I would have become Liberian. I mean, for a million dollars a contract, no change nationality. Leave this God for second place, become Liberian, walk into a bank, say I am George Way, and just get the money. <laughs> But why should they, like he said, why should you change nationality, change name, all in the name of getting finance? And then that brings us to the doorstep of Victoria Namsokai at the bank, as sector head for oil and gas, corporate and investment in the bank. Have you listened to these kind of frustrations from ordinary folks, but with extraordinary opportunities, only shackled by the fact that the banking industry maybe survives and thrives or the absence of trust. I build that trust with us. Thank you, Simon. And um, I think the key question to ask here is, do you have um, the capacity to attract the much needed um, bank financing um, across the, pro the, um, the contracting life cycle? So Ugandan companies, especially SMEs, are having lots of challenges accessing the bank financing. And part of the reason is that um, some of them have low financial literacy, and therefore the banks perceive them as very high risk um, clients, and this is because of the um, undeveloped financial infrastructure. The other thing that comes up is um, some of them are not really big enough to perform contracts of this nature. So what is your performance like? Do you have the capacity to perform a contract of that nature? So this brings uh, lots of challenges, um, especially when it comes to assessing the contract. And some of the things that the banks look at, I think like, um, what is your financial performance like? What are your cash flows like? When you look at your financials, are your cash flows positive? Are, they, uh, are you able to pay back your financial obligations from your operating cash flows? What about your, your gearing levels, things like debt to equity? What, what skin do you have in the game as an SME? Or do you want the bank to come to the table and take 100% of that risk? Some of the other things that the banks look at, um, what is your management like? Do you have experience in what you're doing? Um, what is your governance like? Do you have an independent board? Do you actually have an oversight of your operations? Or is there a very significant key man risk in the business where decisions are made by one or two individuals and, and that will be it? What happens if this individual um, leaves the business? The other thing that uh, um, we look at and Mr. Mugabe mentioned it is the contract. Is your contract bank people? Or do you think that by the fact that you've won a contract, it is automatically bankable? This may not be the case, 
Have you crossed the T's and I's? Have you looked at the commercial clauses? Have you looked at the exit clauses, the termination clauses in that contract? And have you priced properly these contracts? Or have you underpriced it just to make sure you get into the game? And, and on the way, you find that your cash flows cannot actually um, enable you to perform or even pay back the bank obligations. So the contractors have to take these things seriously. It does not mean that by the fact that you have a contract in whatever sector, that it's automatically bankable. You as a company have to have um, that ability to sustain uh, your business, even outside this contract. When you come to ask for the financing, what kind of money are you asking for, depending on the value of the contract you have? And what length of period are you looking at? Because the banks will look at the tenor of your contract and then will match that finance into your contract. Many contractors are not happy when the bank says, no, it's a one-year contract, and so it has to fit within one year. And, and banks have been backed by financing five years for a two-year contract, or for a one plus one plus one, and that means subject to renewal at the end of the year. So some of these things have to be looked into, and most recently, the most topical issue is, what is your view of the environmental, social, and, and governance? Around, around these contracts. Do you have enough systems in place? What are your policies um, in relation to environmental, social, and governance issues that may come up on the contract? And um, the banks are increasingly focusing on this and will take you through a full list just to make sure that your, your project is sustainable because they also do not want to be associated with, with such um, things that will have adverse impact. So what are the critical success factors that should be considered by the companies? Just make sure you have a proper track record of your financials and that they are audited um, by reputable um, audit firms and make sure that your cash flow is higher, make sure your business is profitable and that you have a, the track record to perform. Banks will also look at your credit reference bureau. What is your, your credit history like? These days it's mandatory to, to go to the credit reference bureau. Believe me, even if you won a 200 million contract, but you have a, you're defaulting in another bank, no bank is going to touch you despite the fact that you have a contract. And another thing is, if you do not have a sufficient resources, or if you do not have a sufficient expertise, look for a joint partner. Look for a partner with someone who is stronger than you financially or even technically. And this will make your case much stronger and will make your, your, your contract um, bankable. So I've talked about negotiating. Negotiating skills are very, very important in this contract uh, process. You'll find many times, for example, in the oil and gas, your, your contract employer is much stronger and has more muscle than you. And they, it's not their job to look out for loopholes within the contract. It is your job to look out for those things that may put you at a disadvantage. So if it means employing subject matter experts, please do so to make sure that your contract is backable. But all in all, um, the, the other thing is that you have to maintain a good working relationship with your financials. If you anticipate any challenges, please proactively engage your financials who will understand. But if you keep quiet and keep defaulting, guess what? The next time you come back to the bank, they will not want to, to engage with you. But um, I'm happy that uh, a stand big business incubator has... Now you're preempting my next yes, question. Yes, so <laughs> has gone a long way in making sure that they equip the SMEs along all these lines in terms of contracting, financial management, um, compliance, and all that. So, and that will go a long way in, in risking some of these projects. Thank you. We've had Haviki speaking in the ones and zeros of banking, telling you about, you know, your debt equity ratio, your financials, your what. A friend of mine recently told me and said, Simon, some of us are been trapped in a certain vicious cycle of quasi poverty because I think even our wives just pray we don't get much more than what we have because they look at us and say if this guy gets five times more than what he has clearly I will not only be replaced but I will also be given an assistant 
he will behave in such a way that he, you know, if you're earning 10 million shillings and all of a sudden you are earning 30 million shillings, you will become a different husband. So they pray for us, say, God, keep my husband within this 10 million which he can manage and remain in this vicious cycle. You know, and that's what Vicky has been telling us, are you big enough? Simon here, I've never seen one billion shillings in one band like this. I've never seen it. So I imagine if I got one million dollars, that's 3.6 billion Uganda shillings. I would first get the 0.6 and eat it in live cash, like live notes. <laughs> then buy my favorite drink, I think a bell or some whiskey or something like that. I'm talking about a, a million dollars being a loan. So, so some of you get loans of one million dollars, then you first eat live cash. Then you also talked about something of financial literacy. Now, I don't you be telling us, but you may also wish to know. The more someone is financially literate, does that put any risk for you as a bank? Because I've seen some borrowers who borrow from you genuinely, and after borrowing from you, they turn around you and show you their financial literacy. You check, check the quotes. You will know some individuals I'm talking about. Very financially, you'd rather deal with Kasiak, who doesn't know about how to play games. Just give him your 10, 10 million, put in your 24%, he will give you back his money and won't take you to gymnastics. But anyway, that said, the Stambic Business Incubator. And Mugaga here is a cohort of yours. You know, he's a, one of those that you train on our board six. We've listened to Vicky, but when you are teaching us at the incubator, is this that Vicky has mentioned one of, part of, or all that you teach us? And if you don't, Tony, please close your business incubator because this is the stuff we want to learn, to be literate, to know our financials, to be able to walk into a bank and borrow, to be able to carry out a good joint venture. Tell us, reassure us as an incubator. Uh, thank you very much, Simon. Uh, first of all, the reason why we were set up is to deal with people like you who want to eat the real cash. <laughs> we try to make sure you don't eat the real cash. But um, what she has said, I would actually say all of the above. You know, you know how they say one or two or all of the above. What we decided to do in 2018, 2017 was to say, what are the critical issues that SMEs face as a country? Very entrepreneurial country, but at the same time, the debt rate. If you went to URSB today, Simon, there are over 100 businesses that are registered. You go back today, the same day, 19 November 2022, and find out the status or health of those businesses. You'll find that probably a quarter or less are still active. So what is the problem? What is the problem? A lot of the time it is how to run the businesses or the compliance systems of the business or whatever is going on with the business, especially management, governance, that makes these businesses fail. And Victoria is right. She has so much money, she wants to lend, but she's struggling to find the right attractive business to lend. So this is where the incubator comes in to make your business attractive. We say, we're going to walk with you through a three month journey where we're going to train you, look at your systems, and my brother here can attest to that. And after training you, constantly come back and forth to see how you're doing. Invite you for such events so you can keep networking, keep looping yourself into these conversations that we believe are important for your business to thrive. Now, Simon, let me just probably start with a story, or let me just infuse a story into this conversation. And I will tell you why I'm using this story as an anecdote to this conversation. There's this company. I knew it when I was at Total ENV, I was National Content Manager, and part of my mandate was to look at every single bid and evaluate the local content at the This company always struggled. They wanted to do what the big boys are doing. The slumbergers, Harry Barton, cement fluids, cement, and, and you know, the craziness. But they always struggled when it came to pre-qualification and so on and so forth. This company did not really go far. I joined Stanley. This company was one of the trainer, or tra rather trainees that went into the program, went through the program, three months, got a coach, a mentor, managed to sort out their system. On top of sorting out their system, they got certified, ISO, and all that stuff with our help. We gave them the facilities to use, got them the right trainers, the right practitioners, and you know what? In less than a year of attending the business incubator, 
they were able to provide support to Bolobe on an international logistics front. They were able to provide services to the Water Extension Project in Kadusi, to Kampala. They were able to provide one for silk in terms of maintenance facilities that we maintained. Now, this is in less than one year. Meaning it's possible. And they were also able now to gladly walk to the likes of Victoria and say, of course, we have this pending with the money. That company is in the room today and that's expect to Show yourself. Show yourself, show yourself. If you know where Nicholas came from, Nicholas was, Nicholas, forgive me for saying this, but he was a briefcase. But now, Nicholas has partnerships with uh, uh, Tanzanians and Kenyans. And they've been doing some work as well with uh, Elizabeth, Co uh, Elizabeth Kogo uh, in uh, Kenya, working on a lot of support to the tunnel, uh, 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 to, to the tunnel operations. These are the stories we associate ourselves with. These are the stories that we say are possible. So it's completely, utterly useless when someone says Ugandans cannot do so. We can do them, and if we can prepare them, we would love to do that. And that is what we do at the future. Thank you. I've been watching. Mm -hmm. This is the hug. I've been watching David Mugaga nodding, and I think he must have been humming to this song. If I knew then what I know now, I would have had a UN contract worth a million dollars, and I would not just be here speaking at the conference in Katonga World. Maybe I would be somewhere in Hilton speaking to big boys and all that. But everyone, you have it coming for you. The evidence is over there. And when you say stand up and show yourself, you stood up and clearly it shows that you don't need to talk. The briefest guy is signed, that's it. That's where I am. That's the sign. But, Mr. Walker, with your federation and what you tell us is the support you offer with testimonies such as Uganda's here, Ugaga's, and that, that gentleman was pointed out by Tony, and many seated in this room, and many also watching us online. We need to take the comfort that perhaps you as a federation are not leaving any stone unturned as far as jointly advocating for SMEs in terms of pushing the back in financials like the bank to trust them a little more. Why on the other hand, coming back to your members to preach the gospel of compliance and fixing systems and also pointing them in the direction of training, apprenticeship, and other things. In other words, we are saying, are you as the federation doing that for the good of us to grow or you are wearing suits and looking nice and making good presentations and fancy hotels such as this one? Okay, thank you. Um, first, I always do. Uh, I want to be like the student who was given a question, then he comes to it and puts it on the question. <laughs> <laughs> Especially you who is in Spanish, just ask the question, but the way you ask it in one minute. <laughs> so, uh, I just wanted to say financing is the lifeblood of any economy. Without money, no economy can run. That's why in the 2008 financial crisis, you heard about the credit grant, eh? if you heard about it, where credit simply disappeared. In Uganda, we are in a perpetual credit grant because... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we are in a perpetual credit grant. And I'm sorry for being extreme. This is a standing event. I hope to be respectful. But let me just say it the way it is. Now, Victoria here was speaking the dealing ratio the debt to equity ratio, the cash flows, the manuals, the board of how many of you have boards of directors? There's no, your wife is not there, your child is not there, your father is not there. Put up your hands. You have a board, your wife is not there, your son is not there, and your father is not there. You we can simply say we don't have hands. No, no, <laughs> so the challenge is to bridge this gap. The client that stands with ones and the client that is there in reality. The client is there in Warugay Man Sons. I send the check to my wife. Okay? When I'm not there, I can delegate to my son to delegate to sign this one. So
So what we need to do, I think, really, is to support these SMEs to shift. Um, let us understand how they operate. Because sometimes cash flow statements, uh, balance sheets, profit and loss statements are proxies. The banker wants to know how are you operating. So we must appreciate their position. But at the same time, we're asking you, the banker, those who appreciate ours, some of us are not thieves, but. <laughs> but we love our but That means you ask it from us, because you ask the cash flow statement to prepare it is too many, isn't it? If the outed accounts is around two to three million, isn't it? They ask for outed accounts for three years, that is six. You need to go to uh, tax clearing. You need to go to this other place. Uh, this one just talked about credit difference bureau, you understand? Then you go to there, you go to, before long you have spent 20 million, but you are looking for 150. Then you have to pay insurance, then you take six months, you see eh? So how can you make, and I'm not advocating for informality, because the Federation has been working hard. That's why we have built partnerships, we are starting to better, and other partners to ensure that SME is involved. But at the same time, we want the financing to work, to involve, to meet us. So the Federation has been at the forefront of supporting SMEs to understand processes and to be together. But we are also telling banks and put them up. The banks are also tied by the way. After the financial crisis, this is what, sorry to use this word. After the financial crisis, the US put in place very stringent regulations for banks, based on one, based on two, if you are part of them. These things make it difficult for them to link to us. SMEs because of those requirements. So sometimes we beat you with Victoria, but we are saying to the extent possible, try to ensure that you adapt your product to make them use products. Thank you. Well, it speaks the language to you all understand in this room. Look at the bank, look at Vicky and say, now listen, Vicky. It's the customer you want. How you guys close your eyes and dream of this partner. <laughs> then there is the one that's available before you there. <laughs> so you want to reach them, stretch their legs, you can't them. So what do you do? So how do you then strike a balance between what should and what is? Are you thinking in that direction? Or are you saying for us, we are standing. 20 economies in Africa, we have a, a you know, our money is half the GDP of Uganda, we are big, we don't bow. Why are you saying, well, let's grow with you. We are in here, open companies using the data. Do you now? Are you with us? Thank you. So of course, I stand big. Uganda is our home, and we are here to drive her growth. And we have a, a wide range of clients. I will not tell you that everyone is perfect, but we've been able to bank them across the value chain. What I was trying to say is that we need to, to evolve. We cannot stay in one place and get stuck. We need to continuously improve our processes to make sure that we, we are bankable. And you know what, what happens if you work on, on those things? Your interest rate goes lower. Because the bank sees you as a lower risk client. The higher the risk, the higher the interest rate. So yes, we shall learn, but what, what is the perceived risk? And this is affecting your financing costs. So we have not said we shall not bank the Uganda, because that's what we're here to do, to serve Ugandans. But we need to improve and get to that level. And this will also um, impact on our financing costs in terms of the interest rates that we have to pay for the same thing. As we conclude this final conversation, I have again, we again been watching Mr. Bukaka, and uh, I'm unable to read your facial expressions, please, because of where I am, and where you are looking. But do you feel comforted from what you've heard? The bank say, Incubator has done unto you. What our federation is imparting in us as an SMB, what do you feel? Are we going forward or are we stagnated? Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Simon. Um, 
I notice a big difference from, from the thinking in, in 2004. And now banks are, are trained, they are involved, they are thinking, is actually they are coming towards the middle. Um, adjacencies also need to move from the extreme to the middle. I think by the time we start the, the, the whole journey, we shall have a very good understanding between the SMEs and the banks, because I think both are shifting from extremes. <clears throat> and uh, I, I would commend a lot of the, the Islamic Bank incubator. They have done a great job. Um, all what she's talked about, we actually were taken through and we were mentored. Uh, yes, it's a great job. And I, I was actually asking myself, is it only standing back in doing this, or other banks are going to copy it? <laughs> so, yes, I commend them. Thank you very much. Or you would have gone ahead and been like whim and comfortably make mention of banks that have exceeded this market because they do not invest in us. And yes, if you don't invest more in us, you will go like the other telephone that we talked about, right? Now, I've just realized that John is highly coveted and needed everywhere. So every time I have an opportunity to ask him to say something, then I get inundated by calls to say, he has to leave now. Everyone is waiting to listen and drink from the pool. Huge cup of his wisdom. So John, why did you go and uh, teach and make lives better for more people waiting for us in this room? You have one last word to tell us. Then we can let you go. So first of all, uh, sorry. I just want to thank Stan the King for this fellow. Can you please give them a hand? I've come together a great event and I've been listening to those different sessions and they've been extremely uh, well. Uh, for that, there's a lot of work that we need to do in terms of finance. And as a federation, we are, yes, the banks are doing their part, but we are also being paid in government, please. Share part of our taxes and give back, isn't it? That's why we, we talked about that small business recovery fund. Please follow it. That's why we talked about the. Um, now we heard about the petroleum fund. If you sit there, you may hear that the petroleum fund was launched today and exhausted after one week. So you have to be very keen. Eh? What are the conditions? Who is applying? Who is eligible? Put in the application. Don't complain. When you haven't, when you haven't come. So that's my uh, my um, parting shot. Thank you. I love your parting shot, John. Because we like complaining, and many times you hear people say, things are bad. What do you make and sell that's not being bought? Ah, no, people are poor. Yeah, hey, people are poor. You, as you as done your door, what are you making and saying that people are not buying because they are poor? No, oh, you know I'm worried in bars, I don't see people buying. You make the alcohol, you know. As you hear saying things are bad, you know. That's very important. Also opening our eyes and being alert and being in the room. Petroleum Authority is here. The National Oil Company is here. The Ministry of Energy is here. Everybody that matters is here. Please be in their face. Let us not tire. Let's speak in their face. When they blink, they find us there. They sleep, open their eyes again, find us there. They will have no choice but to deal with us. Yes. John, you may take your leave, but as you take your leave, Tony, okay. you will also now need to speak to us and then invite us to lunch. If I think um, this is, for me, uh, one of the best uh, uh, the conversations we've had when it comes to SMEs. You know, for a long time, we have really considered them to be bystanders. The bystanders, the guys who eat the crumbs after the other people have eaten the real bread. This time, we want to have stories of SMEs that can jump onto the real bread. It's one thing for us to say we have SMEs and they're, you know, participating or contributing massively to the GDP. And it's another thing for us to say we are intentional about creating an avenue for them to be able to thrive. And I think that is what we're committed to. And I think and believe that if we can intentionally continuously have these conversations, and some of them are very inconvenient and you know not very testful, but we need to have 
And as a country, I think it's what can really inspire us all to spread opportunities. The oil and gas situation is here. SMEs are going to have to play a very important role. Let's promote them and let's support them intentionally. And I think it only gives us a good way to work with But now, there's something I learned. I learned from this scenario. A huge multinational organization with branches in Beijing and UK had a meeting in the UK. And they sent one of their top executives from China to attend. And this guy is flown business. He is accommodated at the Savoy. And he attends this meeting. Oh, mama, mama, the whole meeting. And the meeting ended. And then the guys from the UK office asked themselves, why did they invite Mr. Who to this meeting? He sat there, he said nothing. The meeting has ended, he's gone. Thousands of pounds have been spent on bringing him here. The guy has said nothing. Mr. Who arrived in Beijing and his colleagues asked him, so how was the meeting in London? Stuff with them as it was such a total disaster. I never said a word. They saw this spoke, you know how they are, they speak, and then. So now, me, who knew about the story? The question was, why didn't Mr. Who say a word in that meeting? Cultures are different. These British guys in the meeting, they don't ask you to put up your hand. You have a question, you have something. Oh, no. Excuse me, I have something to interject over there. Whoa, 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 mate, can I say something over there? For the Chinese, you need to say, OK. Hmm. Do you have a question? They don't have to put up his hand. It's all century. Uh, now, uh, now I need to ask them, uh, you know, then he will speak. Because you have allowed him, invited him to speak. I look across the room, I suspect some of you, if not all of us, we have Chinese. Tony and Shu here, we have British. They will interject whenever they want to. But for us, we have to be invited to ask or make a comment. So in the spirit of ensuring that you don't walk out of here to lunch and say, what a total disaster this family is coming out of me. I couldn't even be allowed to ask a question. This guy spoke nicely. I'm like, who's here with that? And they think Mugada represents what they may use. And then, so, that's it. One question from a gentleman. The other questions from ladies. Then we go to that. And if there's no question, I'm going nowhere. He stay here. Ah, the gents have been sorted. But you don't come fast. <laughs> so now the other question is from ladies. And I said the other question is we can go until the, as long as the ladies ask. <laughs> we had about changing of names. Yeah, it's changed sense. <laughs> <laughs> a lady has to ask a question or else we go nowhere. That also means you probably the microphone. You just redeem the ladies ask a question. You need.
documentary information something like that. I wanted to show members what uh, SMEs or struggling starting enterprises, what problems they really go through, especially in financing. Looking at the Mugaga's example, one of my clients had a contract, has a contract with Rare, the government agency, to distribute power lines in Western Uganda. So this man imports materials from China. He comes here, stuck with the containers in the URA, 14 containers for materials to finish the project. The project is 60% done. He goes to Rare, government agency, uh, tells them, I am stuck here, I can't get finances to pay taxes. Help me, give me a letter to URA, maybe URA, URA can release my containers, you pay the money directly to URA. Rare says, you cannot pay you, you cannot, I mean, you cannot give me a letter, you look for some finances elsewhere. He goes to the private panel lender. He gives his commercial building. Not about 800 million in Wayoke. To a money lender. The money is not money, first of all. But he has been in business for some time. The money lender says, you bring money for verifications, you want to do such on the title. Finally, he pays money to the money lender, then the money lender says, you bring your wife to sign on the agreement to pay you money. The man tells the money lender, I don't have a wife, but they have a contract to run. All these things have to be done. And the guy ends up being frustrated because he doesn't have a wife <laughs> to sign on the agreement for money lending. The man was saying, we have an experience, someone came and borrowed money, then the wife came and said, no, this thing, you took money, you took our property, we're not interested. So, those experiences. I would, I would think government agencies can assist the like rare, it would have been easier for rare trade to customs to release containers for this contract to be done for the people in Western Uganda. But it was not, not done like that. So the challenges are many, and the people who are working along those lines, I think they have to seek harder to help a person like this. The contract now is expiring, the containers are being auctioned. But they are all government agencies. So it's a, big, it's a big challenge for us the SMEs. Another challenge that we have for us, for example, in the logistics uh, uh, division, you go to a Chinese or an Indian, you have to take their containers from wherever they are, deliver them to Kampala or South Sudan. They'll tell you, you deliver, we'll give you payment after 14 days or after 30 days or 60 days, depending. They want you to give them a price similar to a client who is going to pay you cash. You have to go to the bank, because sometimes you don't have the money. The transporter is from a in Kenya or a Lithuanian wants the money. You put the container in the court, pay the money. Maybe you don't have it, you have to run to the bank. You don't have the money to pay the bank. You are desperate, you want to perform, you don't have the money to perform, the man is not adding you money because he's giving you work on credit. Ending up, you have not performed, a company closes. And that's the reason why most companies are not moving. So it's a challenge. People must think along those lines, especially people who are financing. Thank you, Simon. So now, from what Simon has described and all that, now I understand why we then get questions from ladies because clearly, one, Simon is strange that in this Kampala, a man could not wash a big wife quickly for a soldier. Plenty of people willing to marry for other reasons smaller than you. The wife is the wife must be female. <laughs> and so you see that the challenges the big are many. But also the clarion call on all of us. The challenge can be widened, can be made better, not only by banks, but like you say, government agencies, perhaps, but also now the example of the government agency is a good example of Airtel. So now, the last I checked, Rare is normal. So now you can say someone maybe the reasons why it became normal because of such challenges. So we don't know. The good thing is, like we say in the US, 
the jury is still out there, and the solutions will come. That's it. Invite us to lunch. For me, I don't think the risk of inviting us to lunch and then find it is not lunch. It's only you. Because if it's good lunch, I will take the credit. If it's bad lunch, I want to take the it's so. Take the credit or the hits. Over to you. You're all invited to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Where is it where we had it yesterday? Good. So now we know the location. Ah, there is a burning question. This guy always asks questions whenever I am moderating. I don't know if it's about me or the events where I am. No, I always want to understand where. Now this one is an amendment to what he was asking. And I'm directing it to Victoria. Why? Because we are going for lunch, I assume we are closing. But there are not, other sessions after that. Yes, there are other sessions coming. I, I, I want this one to come either in the next section or now. Uh, we have Unoc here. We have Stanley here. Uh, and we have SMEC House. This SME is where they pre qualify. Supply chain. Or anything. And the supplier, the SME cannot. Uh, <coughs> access the funding to do the job. Is it possible that something can be worked out between the you know, and standing? Like a letter of what? And say we have pre-qualified this company. And we have been moving with it where well. is there a possibility that you can now fund them? Something like that. Is it, is it part of the investor or it is not? Thank you. Take a moment and answer that quickly, and I hope you won't uh, answer like uh, I, I don't know what you answer. It's more like say two parents with bride and groom after the marriage, and then later there are no children, and then they are asking one of the parents to get it over that thing. But I gave you some money, good father. Things can be nice, but I think that's something we can do over lunch. When we return, we go back to the master order. The conversations continue. Thank you very much. Bon appétit. Merci beaucoup.